Well, good morning and welcome to all of you in the building today and <clears throat> also welcome those of you that are watching by a way of the live stream. Uh, you are just as much here with us and you are a part of us and we love you so very much. And so we're very happy to be here this morning in the Lord's house. Just a couple of things I want to make sure you uh, know about. And first of all, I want to talk to you about our connection cards. And those of you that are watching at home can go to our website and you can complete a connection card for us there. Those of you here in the building, there's one in the rack on the back of the pew in front of you. And you can use that to communicate with us. If you complete a connection card with us, you can take it out to the welcome station after the service and we'll give you a gift bag. Uh, and among other things in that gift bag will be one of our Seminole Baptist Church t-shirts. I also want to mention that in the racks is our newest devotional guide. It covers the last chapters of Psalms. So this is Kingdom Psalms Part 4. It begins this Friday, April the 8th. A lot of people picked them up Wednesday night already, but there are some in the racks for you. Racks are right outside these two doors, and they're right outside the back doors on top of the bookcases. And then let me do a little business with you before we uh, move on in our service. Let me introduce to you Mark and Holly Foote. Would you all stand, Mark and Holly? Mark and Holly have been visiting for a while and are back from the pandemic, right? <laughs> and they're moving their membership to Seminole Baptist Church, amen? Isn't that a great thing? Thank you so much. Did you wanna make a speech, Mark? No, okay. <laughs> Thank you all so much. And you know, it seems now the last three or four Sundays we've had people come into the church uh, maybe you're next. Maybe the Lord's speaking to your heart, and maybe uh, you are next. You just never know. Uh, well, thank you so much for being here. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your love and mercy. You're so good to our church. You're so good to all of us individually. You're good to our homes. You're good to us everywhere we are because you are a good God, and you love us in such a wonderful way. And I pray for this service that it would be dedicated to you, that you would be first and foremost in all of our thinking and all of our doing today. And we ask you to bless this time together in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Amen. Let's stand as we worship together and sing, How Great Thou Art.
God, it's the name of Jesus that things happen, things change when the name of Jesus is spoken because the name of Jesus has power and authority. It can move mountains. It can change lives. God, we thank you for the powerful name of your son, Jesus. And it's Jesus alone that we worship in this place today. God, and we know that you are here with us. You are meeting with us here in this place. So we, God, we ask that you would just do a mighty work here today. As Pastor Gary brings your word, we ask that you give him your power and strength. For it's in the holy, precious name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. Amen. So here we are in the last uh, Sunday morning where we're going to be talking about uh, the book of Revelation and the Tribulation. We're going to conclude uh, that series this morning, and we are going to conclude even though there is surely a lot more uh, that could be said. We spent twice as much time in Revelation uh, this year as we normally do, and we still couldn't get it all in, but we'll be back in a couple of years, and I promise you we'll talk about some of the things when we go through it then that we weren't able to get to uh, this time through. But you know, how in the world could I preach through Revelation and the tribulation and then not focus on heaven in the very end? So we're going to back up to Revelation 14, 13 today. Revelation 14, 13. We're also going to look at some of the scriptures in chapter 19 that we didn't get to last week, and we're going to be talking about heaven. Now, during this sermon series on the tribulation, we've learned a lot of things about how things are going to be on earth for those who miss the rapture, for those who are left behind. But I also want to tell you that In the book of Revelation, there's a whole lot said about those who are in heaven, and we get a great idea of what things are like right now for our family, our friends, and our loved ones that are in heaven with the Lord right now. So let's put Revelation 14, 13 on the board. Open up there in your Bible if you like. We're going to use our Bible this morning and look at a few verses of scripture together but let's just read this verse first and then we'll do like we often do we'll come back and we'll look at the verse several more times and we'll just squeeze as much truth out of it as we possibly can so revelation 14 verse 13 john said then i heard a voice from heaven saying to me right blessed are the dead who die in the lord from now on Yes, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors and their works follow them. Now, first thing I want to point out to you is this word right. John heard a voice from heaven, and the first thing that this voice says to him, at least on this occasion, is he wants John to write. Now, let me just tell you this. Throughout the book of Revelation, John receives 11 different commands to write. The first one is found back in Revelation chapter 1, and it's in verse 11. It's very interesting what it says. Revelation 1, 11, the Lord says to John, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last. What you see, write in, now listen to these words, write in a book and send it, singular, to the seven churches. Notice what he tells him to do. He wants him to write. He wants him to write in a singular book. Now, your Bible may say scroll, but whatever it says, it's singular. So he wants him to write a book. That's why I believe the book of Revelation, it's not seven different letters to seven churches. They all went out their own different ways, but it's one book that contains the seven letters, and this one book goes out among all the churches. And guess what? It eventually got to us. It went to those seven churches, then all of the other churches, and now in our day and time, it is as surely written to us as it was to them. So he says, I want you to write in a book. And then in chapter 1, verse 19, he tells John again. He says, write the things which you have seen, 
the things which are, the things which will take place after this. So John is commanded to write. If you go on through the book, you'll see that four times in chapter 2, John is commanded to write. Three times in chapter 3, John is commanded to write. But then something interesting happens. In Revelation chapter 4, John is raptured up to heaven. And he writes the rest of this book from his vision in heaven. And it's interesting now, after all of these times, since chapter 1, chapter 2, chapter 3, John is not commanded to write again until we get here in John chapter 14 and verse 13. Now look at the first part of John chapter 14. It's not on the screen. You'll need to look at it in your Bible. What's happening with John? In, John, in Revelation 14 verse 1, John is in heaven, and he looked and behold a lamb. Notice that capital L. It's talking about Jesus Christ. Then I looked and behold a lamb standing on Mount Zion, with him 144,000, having their father's name written on their foreheads. And he says, and I heard a voice from heaven like the voice of many waters. Do you remember those of you who come to the Wednesday night Bible studies? You remember on Wednesday nights we studied Revelation 1, 2, and 3. And in Revelation chapter 1, verse 11, or no, verse 15, I think it was, when, when Jesus appears to John on the Isle of Patmos, this is what John says. John says, his voice was as the sound of many waters. Now it says the same thing right here in Revelation chapter 14 and verse 2. He hears a voice like the voice of many waters. So let me tell you what's happening for John early in Revelation chapter 14. He is there, he sees the Lamb of God, Jesus. He hears the voice of God speaking to him, and so he is getting a glimpse of what I call heaven at its very best. And you know what he did? He got so caught up in heaven that he forgot to write. And that's what the Holy Spirit is doing for him here in Revelation 14, 13. It is reminding him, you need to be writing this down. So when John returns to his writing, he reveals for us three things about heaven. And there are three things in Revelation 14, verse 13, that reveal some light or shed some light for us on heaven what it's like for our friends, our family members, our loved ones that are there waiting for us. First of all, we are told that heaven is a place of rejoicing. I'm gonna put Revelation 14, 13 on the board for you with a little bit of emphasis on it. Heaven is a place of rejoicing. Let's move forward with our, our screen right now. Revelation 14, verse 13. Heaven is a place of rejoicing. Look at that. All I have to do is say it, and it just appears on the board. He says, then I heard a voice from heaven saying to me, write. And now look how I've underscored for you, I've emphasized for you this word. The first thing that John is to write is, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord. Now, when you're looking at that word I have emphasized for you on the screen this morning, or that I have emphasized with my voice as I read it this morning, when you're looking at that word blessed, I want you to understand that it comes from a word that is translated happy in other places in the Bible. Let me just go ahead and tell you this. In four, at least four different translations of the Bible, the word is translated happy here in Revelation 14, 13. Happy are the dead who die in the Lord. And it's translated that way in several other places in the Bible. Let's move forward and put some scripture from John chapter 13 on the board for you. And we're going to be looking at verse 15 and verse 17. In John 13, verse 17, and I'm giving this to you from the King James Version of the Bible. In John 13, 15, this is what Jesus said. 
He says, for I have given you. Now he's talking to his disciples and he's ultimately talking to us. This was spoken to them. It was written and recorded for us. For I have given you an example that you, believers in that day and believers in this day. For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. And then he said this, if you know these things, happy are you if you do them. And at least 17 different translations of the New Testament use the word happy here in John chapter 13 and verse 17. Now the interesting thing about that is this word that's translated happy here is the same word that's translated blessed in Revelation 14 and verse 13. That's why I say our loved ones are rejoicing because how are they in heaven? Well, the Bible tells us that they are happy in heaven, that they are rejoicing in heaven. Let me show you some more scripture. Let's put 1 Peter 3 and 1 Peter 4 on the board for you. Here's some, some good scripture. And again, I'm taking this from the King James, but I could have pulled it from another 15 or 16 other translations of the Bible, and it would read very much the same way. Peter writes to believers, and he says, even if you suffer for righteousness sake, happy are you. Look at verse 14 of chapter 4. If you are reproached for the name of Christ, happy are you. In other words, Peter writes to these believers and he says, you may not be living in happy times, but you can still be happy people. And that word that's translated happy there in both of those verses is the same word in Revelation 14, 13 that's translated blessed in my New King James Version of the Bible, that's translated happy in other translations of the Bible. You know, when I first became a Christian, I heard someone say this, and they, they said it so fast that I couldn't remember exactly what they said, but I jotted down in the cover of my Bible the best I could trying to remember this quote. And this is what the person said. He said, since I became a Christian, I'm happier when I'm not happy than I used to be happy when I was happy. Now that may not make sense to you, but it made all the sense in the world to me. Since I became a Christian, I'm happier now when I'm not happy than I used to be happy before I was a Christian when I thought I was happy. And why is that? Because the believer's joy, the believer's happiness, it's, they're not based on our circumstances, but they're based on Jesus Christ. And I had to think about what Peter said to these suffering believers in his letter there. I had to think, if we can be happy here in this world with things like they are, if we can be happy here, just think how happy we're going to be when we get to heaven. Oh, my friends, it is a happy place. Let me put some scripture from Revelation 19. This is some of the scripture that we didn't get to last Sunday morning, but let's look at Revelation 19, verses 6 and 7. Revelation 19, verses 6 and 7. And here's what John says. Can you get there for me, Brandon? Revelation 19, verses 6 and 7. And he says, And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude, as the sound of many waters, and as the sound of mighty thunderings. Now let me stop here and say this about that scripture. Do you notice the singular versus the plural? I heard, as it were, the voice of, singular of a great multitude, plural, as the sound singular of many waters, plural, as the sound singular of mighty thunderings, plural. And I look at this and I think this about heaven. When we get to heaven for the first time, ever in our lives, we're going to be in a place where everyone loves and serves God 
together where all of our voices are one voice, all of our sounds are one sound, and we will finally in heaven be a people that every one of us, everything we say, everything we do, we will do it united, we will do it together, and it will all be to the honor and the glory of God. Look at what this one voice of a great multitude is saying. They're saying, hallelujah, for the Lord God omnipotent reigns. No wonder it says, let us be what? Glad. Let us do what? Rejoice and let us give him glory. So as we look at the Bible, we know that heaven, first of all, is a place of rejoicing. But I have to hurry on now. Let's talk about Revelation 14, 13 again, and let me tell you that the second thing that he tells us is that heaven is a place for resting. Let me read the verse to you again. Then I heard a voice from heaven saying to me, write, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors that they may rest from their labors. You know, an interesting thing about this word translated rest here. In another place in the Bible, it's translated refreshed. Do you remember in 1 Corinthians chapter 16 and verse 18, when Paul had received a love offering from another church to help him and the church at Corinth? Remember what he said to those believers at Corinth? He said, for they refreshed my spirit. They refreshed my spirit and yours. Our spirits were tired. Our spirits were wearied. And it might have been even for the Apostle Paul, his spirit was not just wearied, but maybe it was even worried. And then when he received this love, this expression of love from another church, he says, I was refreshed. That word is the same word as rest here in Revelation chapter 14 and verse 13. Then it goes on to say resting from what? Resting from their labors. And I want to tell you this morning that there's more to that word labors than what might first come to your mind when you read it. Some places in the New Testament, this word for labors is translated troubles, efforts, and even travails. And at least three different translations talk about not labors, but hard, hard work or very hard work. But let me tell you something even more interesting than that. There are places in the New Testament where this word for labors is translated weary or weariness. Let me put some scripture from 2 Corinthians chapter 11 on the board for you. 2 Corinthians 11, and we're going to look at some of verse 23 and some of verse 27. But i tell you what I want to do. I want to back up, and I want to read it to you from all that Paul has to say, and then emphasize what we'll have on the board. In 2 Corinthians chapter 11, and starting in verse 23, Paul says, Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool, but I am more. In labors, and that's what I have on the board for you, in labors more abundant, in stripes above measure, in prisons more frequently, in deaths often. He says, from the Jews, five times I received 40 stripes minus one. Now under Roman law, the most you could do to anyone was give them 39 lashes. You had to stop at 39. Paul says, five times I was beaten with a whip and I was given 39 lashes, 40 minus one. I want you to think about this. When Paul writes this letter, he is writing it with 195 whip marks on his back. Can you imagine that? 195 scars on his back. Verse 25, he says, three times I was beaten with rods, once I was stoned, three times I was shipwrecked, a night and a day I've been in the deep. Verse 26, he said, in journeyings often, 
in perils of waters, perils of robbers, perils of my own countrymen, perils of the Gentiles, perils in the city, perils in the wilderness, perils in the sea, perils among false brethren. I don't know if you counted those, but those are seven perils, seven times. Seven's the number of perfection. Paul was saying, my life has been a perfect storm. I'm telling you, I've had everything that could happen happen to me. But then he said what I have on the board for you in verse 27. He said, in weariness and toil. In weariness. That word for weariness is the same word that you'll find right here in Revelation 14 and verse 13. We get rest from our what? Rest from our labors. Rest from our weariness. There's an old hymn my mother used to to sing. It was written by a Methodist minister, I think in 1901. His name was Frank Graff. My mother used to stand at the stove and she would sing this hymn while she cooked. Now she was a good Baptist because she would sing the first and last stanza. Amen? I mean, that's what we do on Wednesday night. And so mom would sing the first and last stanza of this hymn. Let me tell you something about this hymn. This hymn was written by a Methodist minister who had just been to the funeral of his youngest sister. She was his third sibling to die. He had already buried his mother and his father, and his heart was breaking. And he sat down and he wrote that wonderful old hymn called, Does Jesus Care? My mother would sing that hymn. She would stand at the stove stirring that pot and she would sing that hymn while she was cooking. Now my mother didn't have the easiest life. She lost her mother, her father, when she was a little girl. She lost her mother when she was about ready to go to what we call middle school now. She and her next oldest sister were raised by her older sisters and their husbands. She was raised with with her nieces and nephews, but knew them like brothers and sisters because the older sisters took them in to keep them from going to an orphanage. My mother went to school, and she was on what they called free lunch. Now, free lunch then was different than free lunch is now. Free lunch then, you didn't get in line with the other kids. There was a separate line that went to a separate window, and over that window were big letters, free lunch. And what you got at free lunch was something left over from what the other kids had had earlier that week. And if there were no leftovers, my mother said, you got a slice of bread with a spoonful of gravy on it. And there was even a table marked free lunch. So the free lunch kids went to a different line, they got a different meal, and they sat at a different table from all the other lunch kids. Well, my mother decided she was going to have herself a bought lunch, that's what she called it. So she went out and she picked up pop bottles, she, she swept people's yards, remember when people swept their yard? She swept yards, she raked yards, she did chores, she raised enough money to get a bought lunch. And she went into the cafeteria that day. She got in line. A teacher came over to her and said, Jeanette, you're in the wrong line. You have to go to the free lunch line. She said, no, no, I've got money. I'm going to buy my lunch today. And she said the teacher made her show him the money before he let her stay in the line. When she got up to where they were serving the food, one of the ladies said, Jeanette, honey, you're in the wrong line. You've got to go to the free lunch line. My mother said, no, I got money. I'm going to buy my lunch today. And so she bought her lunch. And when she walked out with her little tray, she realized something. She didn't know any of the kids at the paid lunch table. She didn't have any friends there. So she took her little lunch over to the free lunch table. And I'll never forget what she told me. She said, son, I learned two things that day. First, I learned that it's a wonderful feeling to work hard and get something that you want. And then she said, and the second thing I learned was it's even more fun when you share it with everyone at the table. 
So everybody at free lunch table that day got a little bit of paid lunch. My mother grew up, it was rough, it was tough. She had a hard time growing up. Then, of course, she got married. She had Bruce. Then she had me. Then she had Jay and Lori, and those two were trouble, trouble, <laughs> trouble. I mean, especially compared to me. They were trouble, trouble, <laughs> trouble. Life never was really easy for my mother. So she would stand at that stove and she would stir that pot and this is what she would sing. Does Jesus care when my heart is pain too deeply for mirth or song as the burdens press and the cares distress and the way grows weary and long. Does Jesus care when I've said goodbye to the dearest on earth to me and my sad heart aches till it nearly breaks is it aught to him does he see and then she would put on her all-time best loud voice and she'd sing the chorus and she'd sing oh yes he cares I know he cares his heart is touched with my grief when the days are weary and the long night dreary. I know my Savior cares. Then on February 12th, 2004, my mother closed her eyes in hospice house and immediately opened her eyes in heaven and when she got there she realized just how much he cares there's a place of rejoicing it is a place of resting but I need to hurry now and just tell you last that heaven is a place for rewarding let's put Revelation 14 13 on the board one more time he said, then I heard a voice from heaven saying to me, right, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors. And then look at this last line. And their works follow them. Have you ever heard somebody say, you can't take it with you? Well, next time they say that, then you respond to them this way. It all depends on what it is is if it is something that's been done for the honor and glory of God it will be there in heaven waiting for you when you get there if it is something that was done as a good work a kind gesture to help someone else to see that God loves them and God cares about them when you get to heaven that will be there waiting for you yes you can take it with you if it is the right thing if it was something done for the honor and glory of God you can take it with you we will have rewards in heaven now let me put first Corinthians 3 13 and 14 on the board and I need to close with this this morning in first Corinthians 3 12 Paul writes about a believer's works. And in 1 Corinthians 3.12, he compares or likens the work of a believer to gold, silver, and precious stones, or to wood, hay, and stubble. Now, what would you rather have on your resume when you stand before the Lord? Gold, silver, precious stones, or wood, hay, and stubble? And stubble well let me just tell you right now you won't get any wood hay and stubble into heaven with you because look what it says it says that each one's work will become clear or made manifest or we'll know what kind of work it was whether it was a gold silver precious stone work or a wood hay and stubble work the day will declare it why because it will be revealed by 
fire. Can you imagine what will happen when that wood, hay, and stubble is tested by the fire of God's judgment? The fire will test each one's work of what sort it is. If anyone's work which he has built on it, that's the foundation of Christ, he will receive, what's the last two words? A reward. He will receive a reward. Heaven is a place for rewarding. And I hope, my friend, that what you're doing with your life, your time, your energy, is sending things before you to heaven to wait for you when you get there so that you can be rewarded with them. And then I honestly believe this. Why do you want a reward in heaven? Well, remember in Revelation chapter 4, when John first got raptured up to heaven, what did he see? He saw those, those people on those 24 thrones taking their crowns and casting them at the feet of Jesus. Why will it matter to you if you have a reward in heaven? Because if you have a reward in heaven, then you will have something to give to Jesus. What's done for Jesus here, we can give to Jesus there. Amen? Don't you want it to be that way? Let's bow our heads. You know, the only thing that can get into heaven are things that are acceptable to God. And that's not just good works. That's talking about people. That's why Paul wrote to the church in Ephesus. And he said that we are accepted in the beloved, talking about Jesus Christ. The only thing that will get us into heaven is that we have been accepted by God because of the blood of Jesus Christ. And my friend, if you're counting on anything other than the blood of Jesus to get you into heaven today, you don't need to be thinking about rewards right now. You need to be thinking about the redemption of your soul. You need to be ready now to cry out to Jesus and know that Jesus died on the cross for your sin and that all you have to do is to cry out to him, call out to him, acknowledge what he's done for you and accept him into your heart as your personal Lord and Savior. Before you ever think about sending anything ahead to heaven, you need to make sure that you're going to heaven when you die. And the only way to do that is to know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. Don't leave here today without talking to somebody about that. If you're unsure about your eternity, don't leave here today until we talk about it, till we pray about it, till we look at the scripture about it. And you can leave here today being happier when you're not happy than you used to be happy when you were happy. Let's pray together. Father, as we have this time of invitation, we commit our hearts and lives to you. Lord, we want to serve you, not just because we'll have rewards in heaven, but we want to serve you because we love you, because you have given your life for us. We want to give our lives to you in service. You sacrificed for us. Therefore, Lord, we want to serve you. Help us to be mindful of what we can do to bring honor and glory to your name in this life and on this earth and help us to leave here today determined to serve you from this moment forward in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.